Uh, on the sandbox, I have like an index HTML. I have a source folder uh, with a JS and a CSS file. Uh, the code sandbox is a virtual environment that is a little bit different than our actual local environment. Uh, so there might be some like different uh, results sometimes on the console or the behavior uh, might differ a little bit. But um, what we're seeing here is a web page that is uh, running a visual web browser and a, uh, the VS Code editor. The VS Code editor is a code named Monaco. So it's based on HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. So this thing that we see running here is actually VS Code's uh, editor. And we can, you can use it even on your own projects. It's an open source uh, uh, software. So I will be opening um, the CSS and I will be using the HTML right here. We'll try to see if um, now, um, on this uh, on this code sandbox, um, there is a special like uh, property, a special feature. Uh, there is a software, there is a utility running that looks at the folder, looks at this folder, and packs everything it sees inside here, like the CSS, um, and loads it on the on the on the web browser so if i put inside the body an h1 tag let's wait title and i put here like uh or no okay i think that's no let's link uh source Okay, that was, okay. Ignore what I mentioned before. Um, that was only about the, the JavaScript, okay. So I'm loading this styles file. Uh, let me know that you can, you can see the link. Uh, projects are free in code sandbox there. Yes, you can use sandbox for free. There's a paid plan, but you can, uh, I'm using like the free plan. Uh, so I'm loading this style CSS where I'm going to write some CSS. I will be folding this section as I won't be needing to add anything more. I will remove the script for JavaScript right now. And we're going to, 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 look, to look, uh, and, and talk about the position, uh, in CSS. So the first thing I want to do is I want to draw a border around some of the elements that I will be using. For example, this H1, this H2, and a paragraph. Now, <clears throat> I will draw a border. just to see where these elements really sit. Uh, who can tell me what kind of elements are these three elements? Which of the two basic categories of HTML elements do they fall into? Are they inline or are they block elements? They're block, exactly. Uh, they just cover the whole width of the, uh, of the containing element. They are using a single line for their own content. Uh, its block element has its own uh, new line to display its content. And the reason why, why we see this like uh, a white space around them is because the body has actually a margin um, which uh, gives this extra space uh, on the left and on the right. Uh, and by default, also these elements, this H1, H2, and P tags, uh, even though I haven't set like the margin for body or a margin or a padding, they have some 
um, default styles. Uh, these are styles that are applied by the browser. Why is that? Because the browser wants the titles and the subtitles and the headings and the paragraphs to uh, be different, to look different, uh, so that they stand out. Um, if all these had like the same size and the same weight, for example, font, if I override them to their normal like weight and the normal, let's say, common size, they would just look the same. So just to give a bit of a styling on the uh, elements that need to stand out, uh, its browser gives some kind of basic styling uh, on the headings, as you saw, uh, so that even we're not even when we're not using CSS, we can have a pretty decent uh, page where its element uh, and its role is apparent, and it um, uh, it is there to show us that. These are titles, these are subtitles, these are paragraphs. There are some, uh, let's say, uh, notes, subnotes, and stuff like that. This is also known as the user agent style sheet. Um, so, user agent style sheet, some default CSS styles applied by the browser, aka user agent. Um, and you can check these default styles from uh, with an inspector by inspecting the elements. Uh, so let's talk about position. Now, uh, the first thing I want to to, to, to note here is that all the elements have a position um, CSS property and it has by default, as uh, happens with all the other CSS properties, it has a default value. Uh, so let's try to see um, how we can find the, let's say the display property of the H1 tag. So what's the value of the display property for the H1? Who can tell me how we can see what's the default value of uh, the display property for each of these elements? Uh, sorry, I'm really sorry, the position. Inspect, yes, we should inspect, definitely. So I'm going to use the inspector. I'm going to use the inspector, of course, on the element. Okay, that's the first step. Thank you. Uh, and where should I find like the um, position of, of H1? Uh, right now, I only see my stupid like uh, here question mark. Okay, so let's say position and position oh and it's position static uh, we just found the computed which means it's like the value that is given to this uh, element and to the css property by default when we don't write uh, we don't give it a value ourselves so by default the position of html elements is set to static so default value of all elements. What means static? It means that the elements are placed on the DOM, on the document, um, according to their behavior, either as block elements or inline elements. The browser parses the document, goes through the HTML elements, depending on the role or on the on their category they belong to, uh, it places these elements um, and it positions them in, an, um, in the uh, place in the, where they belong and they sit um, on the page. Uh, if I don't write this position, static, it's always there. Now, 
if we want to override this, uh, this uh, value and this default position, uh, we can use some different values. And we'll see the first one, which is uh, the position relative. So before going and seeing some of, the, of these values for position, I'm going to set a different width for these three elements. And I'm going to set the background color. Let's say lavender. Okay, just to make them stand out. Um, so I'm giving a width of 15, uh, 50 uh, percent, meaning it's the actual viewport width by half. Uh, or uh, in this case, it's the container of these three elements. The container of these three elements, it's the body. The body has, I don't know, let's say 1000 pixel. 50% of this size of this width is 500 pixels. And so the elements contained inside the body will take 50, uh, sorry, 500 pixels, which is 50% uh, of, uh, of the body of the container element. Now, with position static, these elements remain, as uh, I said before, where they are supposed to, uh, to stay, um, on a new line and on the left side of the, um, uh, of the document. The, the way that the layout, the flow, let's say, of the document works is like from uh, top to bottom and from left to right. Now, if I want to move these elements from their static, their initial position, I can use the position relative. So I'm going to the H1 and I'm changing the position from position static to position relative. Now, the cascading effect now is acting right here on this code. Since we have the same CSS property twice, the one that comes last, uh, the one that comes at the end, is always uh, the one that is enabled and active. Position static right now is no longer active, is no longer enabled, it is overridden by the last position. Let's double check with the inspector, of course. And as you can see, the inspector has a much nicer image. It has this strike through uh, all over the, the first position, meaning that this is not applying right here on this element. This is like it has been disabled. And what we are seeing is actually the position relative. At this point, if I disable position relative and position static becomes active, you will see no difference at all. So it's like they're doing the same thing. Uh, and this is the, uh, the behavior. When we set position relative on an element, nothing changes. The element stays right where it uh, was supposed to be placed, uh, the, the, the initial static position, but we have some extra capabilities right now. Now, this enables us to push the element from its initial static position. By changing uh, gears and switching from static to relative, we can push this element and we have to uh, select, we have to uh, push it from one of its four sides. From the left, we're pushing from the left to the right. We can push it from the right to the uh, left, we can push it from the bottom uh, to, to the top, to upwards, or we can uh, push it from uh, the top to the bottom. In order to do that, we use four uh, CSS properties for one of the sides. So if I want to push the title from the left to the right, 20 pixels, I will use left 20 pixels. So pushing the element from the left 
to the right. You can think of as a, a hand or a little person here pushing the element from the left side to the right. So this corresponds to the side uh, from which we start like pushing. If I want to also push from the top to the bottom, towards the bottom, I will say 40 pixels. And as you can see, now the element falls like on top of the um, other element. So we have um, left, top, bottom, and right. We can use, we can use top, right, bottom, left. And I place them in a clockwise manner, starting from the top to the right to the bottom to the, to the left, because this clockwise uh, order matters in CSS. It's, it's actually uh, something that we will find later on. So stick with the clockwise uh, order of, uh, of this element. At this point, it doesn't matter if I put left on the top or like here. So it doesn't matter. It's the same thing. Um, and of course, I have to uh, select either top um, or bottom, left or right, if I want to, to move the, um, the element in different direction. I will do the same thing with H2. So I will go to H2. And to see the difference between position static and position relative, um, so uh, I will try, let's say, uh, left right now. And I will say 20 pixels. As you can see, nothing happens on, ele on the element uh, H2 because, because its position is position static and static means never moves. Uh, so if I really want this element to move from its initial position, from it's static, let's say, condition, I have to put position relative. And of course, I can put this here and uh, move it. So with position relative, we are able to push the element uh, around its sides. Now, the important thing here to, um, to note is that if we inspect the element, let's go here, um, you will see that it takes up like the, uh, the whole line still. So we're pushing, but this orange color means that it's still taking up uh, its own line. And uh, as you can see, let me let me, uh, I will disable uh, the left and right. Okay, why? Okay, uh, let me, okay, code sandbox doesn't help really here. So I will, um, I will comment this out. or I will disable these properties with just adding some random letters. So the thing I want you to notice here is, I'm just disabling the left and bottom, is that, uh, for example, the subtitle uh, takes up some space. It takes up uh, a whole line to display its content from left to right, even though the width is like 50%, the whole light uh, is uh, here, uh, taken up by, by this uh, block element. Uh, if I move the element, let's say, from the bottom to the top, the line, the space that this element is, was at least uh, we, we saw that it was taking up, is still there. So moving with position relative, uh, an element up, down, left or right, doesn't mean that we leave the space empty we're still occupying the space that the element was occupying before, but uh, the actual content is moved uh, uh, relative 
to the static position. So it's like we have still this space uh, being owned by the element, but the content is moved around with this um, top, left, right, and, and bottom. So it's not like it's giving up its space, the subtitle, let's say. Uh, otherwise, the lorem ipsum here paragraph would pick its place and would go upwards. There's still space here uh, that is used by the element. We're just seeing the element being moved, the content being moved uh, around. So its element still occupies the space uh, that it did before, um, and it's just moving around. So this is important to uh, understand. So the relativity exactly refers to the original position. It's, it's relative, the movement is relative to the initial static position. Uh, exactly, that's the, the relative uh, part. And um, so what was the initial position? Let's go to, uh, to the paragraph. So what's the initial position? You can see all the box. This whole line is occupied by the block element. The content width is set to 50 pixels, uh, to 50%, sorry. Uh, now, if I move this element, it will be relative to this uh, area. So if, if I say paragraph position relative, let's say uh, bottom 20 pixels, uh, from where it was like uh, before, it's now moved upwards like 20 pixels or I don't know, 120 pixels. Uh, now with the inspector, we cannot really see like the, uh, the old, let's say, position or the static position highlighted, um, but we can see the, the element moving. Uh, the position is still there, it's occupying space and it doesn't let other elements uh, go into that place. Um, so let's refresh uh, because I just made the changes on the inspector. This is position relative. Uh, we can have like top, left, bottom, and right. We can even have negative values. So if I say paragraph position relative, and I'm going to push from the right. No, I'm going to push from the left. But instead of pushing, I will be, let's say, pulling. So if I put a negative value here, is like putting a negative value, is like pulling the element towards that direction, meaning the, the left. The, so I'm just pulling uh, towards the left side uh, 50 pixels. And you can do, uh, you can use negative values and relative values with all the, uh, the for all four sides. And just to uh, spice things up, um, I'm going to um, put a, uh, I'm going to put a hover pseudo class. So I'm going to say that um, this paragraph has position relative and it will be moved, let's say to the left only when the user hovers over the element. So I'm going to move the left here. And as you can see, let me see. Okay, uh, when I hover over, when I put the cursor over the element, uh, the left turns from the default value, which is zero to minus 50 pixels. And I get this like uh, effect only on the hover. 
so we can use this CSS uh, properties with pseudo classes and different conditions of the of the element, and to make it even more like uh, fancy. Um, Right now, you can see that the, um, the difference, the, the difference, the toggling, let's say, between these two states, like going from left zero, which is the default value, to left minus fifty pixels, is like uh, there's a, like a harsh change. Like we have a bang bang from one state to another. It's pretty rough, um, and we see like this ugly uh, changing. I can use a CSS property called transition. To make this change between the two uh, values, like zero, left zero, and left minus 50 pixels, to make this transition a little bit smoother. In order to do that, I can use the transition property. I can say which CSS property I want to uh, make tra the transition work on. I will give it an amount of time that I want this change, this transition to happen. You will see this in a while, which is two seconds to S for seconds. I can also use milliseconds. And I can uh, um, provide here like uh, sort of like a graph. Uh, I won't go into details right now on how this transition should happen. This is like a, uh, sorry. Um, this is how the, the transition will happen. Um, you can dig and find more about the different values. Uh, so let's see. No, this does not. Wait, let it mm, left. Oh, it's position. Sorry, position. I'm not. Um, let's see. No, it's not position. Why? Okay. Uh, let me see. This will. Uh, that's my mistake. I have to set an initial value here. I have to explicitly set left equal to zero. Uh, and I think now it will work. No, it's the left. Okay, I'm changing the left. Uh, sorry, get mixed up. So I think, yeah. So I'm setting the left, an initial value for the left, which is the default value. But if I want the transition to work, I must explicitly say, this is the uh, the first value. Otherwise, the transition won't know what the initial value will be. Uh, and I'm uh, adding the CSS property that I want to be smoothly transitioned from one state to another, meaning from zero to minus 50 pixels. So with transition, we can place left, bottom, the color, uh, everything we, we want. And then instead of seeing this like really uh, uh, bad, you know, uh, left and right uh, toggle. Uh, we just see a transition that takes up two seconds. Um, so you can set it to one second. We can set it to half a second. And we can even use milliseconds. The transition is uh, a transition between two states. And right now we're transitioning from this state which is like the paragraph in its initial state. And this state, which is when, when the state changes from its initial, let's say, state to a hovering state. So we must set the transition on the uh, initial state. So we say whatever happens uh, to this element, whatever changes with any way possible, it's not only with hover, uh, we want a transition to happen. So we set this on the like uh, on the initial the um, uh, state like the the tag selector or the class selector, and then on the hover or um, on some other pseudo class, let's say uh, we set like the 
the next value or the, the value that they want uh, to change. Uh, so it actually makes more sense to put it on the initial uh, state. We say, okay, this element, we want it to have a transition whenever something changes. And we can either use left or bottom or uh, even a combination of um, CSS properties, but we can also uh, use uh, all and then we say, okay, Here's the initial color. Here's the initial background color, uh, which is actually, we, uh, let's, let's put light coral. Uh, we want a transition to happen if this changes, okay? And so whenever these initial values change in some way, then we want a transition. So uh, then, uh, we have hover. Uh, what else can I use now? Uh, hover. Okay, I don't have, I think, many uh, background color. So now, not only left, but also background color or any other um, CSS property will transition from one state or one value to another. And as you can see, with just a single line of CSS, we get this like, really nice, uh, fancy effect. Set your transition on the initial state of the element, like when you set the tag selector or the class, and then you can change the value either using a CSS uh, pseudo class like hover, or uh, most of the times with JavaScript. So when we click a button, when we drop down when we uh, drag something, when we, I don't know, interact with the element, uh, we set some uh, value, um, we, we, we change some value, uh, position, color, size, width, whatever, and uh, we get this transition. Mm -hmm. So I will comment this out, okay, and, okay, let me refresh. Can you see the difference now? Let me put more seconds here. Okay, all of you, I mean, and... it transitions both the color, the background color, and the left. So when these two properties change, they transition uh, during two seconds. Whereas when I had like only the left, the transition worked only on the left. So as you can see, the change of the color is like immediate. There's no transition. Bam, bam, bam. The only transition is happening on the position, on the left, on the change of the left. So we can combine many uh, CSS properties, singular or, or many, and uh, we can even use all to combine, uh, to, to make the transition work on everything. I think if I remember correctly, I can put, uh, it's like this, I think, uh, you know, uh, it's comma. I always forget about the syntax for this one. No, okay. Okay, uh, uh, transition left. Okay, I have to remember. I always forget about this syntax. Um, I use margin right. I use all, all the time. Um, uh, all margin right. Uh, apply to one property. Apply to two parameters. Ah, it's comma. Okay, okay, it's comma. 
So uh, if I want to use just two parameters, I will just say left, and that's why I don't use the syntax. Uh, I can even change the, the setting, the, the time for each of these. So I'll make this second, but so as you can see, it takes two seconds to change the left and four seconds to change the background color. Let's make this even more. Now that the color is still, is still changing, it takes four seconds. And if I were to change something else right now, for example, bottom or I don't know, the width or the height or something else, it wouldn't transition. It would just change immediately because I only have left and background color. Um, so we can use, uh, oops, no, sorry. Uh, I will put some different cases. So transition happens on all CSS properties that change their initial values. Uh, transition happens only when the left CSS property changes. And then transition happens on left and uh, background color. Uh, which is a syntax that always confuses me, as you probably guessed. But we can use it because uh, if we're not going to target, like uh, if we don't want transition to work on all the CSS properties, which might be like producing some side effects if we don't want, you know, like a certain value to transition, but just change immediately, we might want to use some of these, um, one of these two syntaxes. When we moved uh, the element uh, subtitle or the title. Now, uh, let's say the subtitle is, uh, let's make it H2, let's move it a little bit to the um, 10. Okay, just a little bit of its initial position. Um, so you can see that the title is actually behind the, uh, the subtitle because the title is being uh, is present on the document before the uh, H2. So we have the H1 and the H2 is, let's say, uh, it's next, it's, it comes after the, the subtitle comes after the title. And that's why we see the subtitle on top of the uh, title. And the same would happen if we uh, were to uh, move the, uh, the paragraph from its initial bottom left, bottom, sorry, zero to, let's say, uh, like 40, like this. So the, um, the, the elements, as you can see, are stacked uh, depending on the order in which uh, the browser finds them in the HTML document. We have H1, then we see H2 on top of H1 because it comes after H1, and we have like the paragraph that comes after H2 because that's the last element uh, that we see inside body. So when we uh, uh, move the elements around, there is a probability of some elements uh, like uh, being placed on top or at least in the same area of other elements. Then we have what is called the stacking order, which is all about how uh, the elements appear uh, as if they were like placed on, a, let's say, on a table and we were like viewing them from the top. If I place like three papers on a, on, a, on a table, the first one will be at the bottom, the next paper will be on top of it, and the next one will be on top of both of these uh, papers, let's say. So the default stacking order is 
um, taken from uh, the order in which we write uh, these elements. H1 is like placing a paper on table, then we place another element, the H2, on top of H1, and then we get uh, like the paragraph. Whenever we use a position other than static, uh, we just seen relative, but there are more to come, um, <clears throat> we have the ability to also change the stacking order of these elements, meaning uh, the, the, the way that they appear uh, in sort of like a 3D, uh, let's say, way, like we have uh, a depth in our, in our page, um, using what is called the Z-index property. Before uh, changing uh, the Z-index property, let's go and inspect an element. So uh, let me, okay, H1. What happens here? Elements, okay, there's probably back here, H1, okay. So I have H1 with its position relative. Let's go to compute it and find uh, the Z index. Z is uh, concerned with the, um, uh, with let's say the Z axis. It's like a 3D axis. We have X axis. By default, you might say that we have like a two dimensional space on our web page. We have like the X axis and the Y axis like this and elements are placed like uh, like this and depending on the x and the y there you can say that they have some x and y coordinates um, with the z index we are having something like a an axis going to the back let's say a, a, a 3d uh, let's say that our elements now have like, you know, depth, they are 3D. Uh, so this means that we can now not only uh, move the elements uh, vertically and horizontally, but also move them, let's say, to the back. So I can move this element to the back uh, like this, or I can move it to the front. And this happens with all elements that have a custom uh, position, a, a position other than static. So this is the Z and um, we can like move these um, uh, elements on the Z axis using numbers. And we have like, uh, let's say zero, one, two, minus one, minus two. So when we want to go to the back, we use a lower number, a lower integer, or a higher one we want to, when we want to bring that element to the front. So uh, the Z index that we're going to see today, uh, is going to provide the opportunity to change the, the way that these elements uh, behave and are displayed. Meaning that if we have like uh, H1, one and then we have on top of that let's say um, h2 now okay this doesn't look like it's a little bit transparent but we have h2 we have h1 because we we uh, we had h1 on the text on the source code uh, before h2 and then h2 comes after but we can switch their places and move this to the back or we can move this to the front of the z-axis. So we can move them like this uh, in the z-axis, and then we will see a different uh, um, display on the on the page because it's like a getting the paper that we put on the table. Uh, and, and and messing around with uh, the way that they are placed on the on the table one on top of each other. 
So by default, we have Z index auto. But if I'm if I want to take, let's say the the title, which sits right now at the bottom, and I change the Z index index to zero, I will get nothing. But if I get one, you will see that it uh, comes uh, on the front and all the other elements have the default value, which you can think of it as zero. So they're placed on the, uh, depending on the order they are uh, written, H2, then uh, paragraph. But if I override the default Z index uh, with one or 10 or 100, it doesn't uh, matter, then I'm, I'm uh, uh, putting a custom uh, Z index, a custom stacking, let's say, uh, order, and I'm moving this element to the front. If I want to uh, place, let's say, the H2 right now on top of the title, I will have to give a bigger value. So I will have to, to say uh, 101. And if I want the paragraph to also be able to uh, come, I don't know, like uh, even like this, uh, this will be placed on the front. So with Z index, I'm, let's say, messing, no, I'm messing, I'm, I'm changing the, the stacking order, as it's called, the way that these elements are uh, being displayed, uh, like having a depth of being like on top of an, uh, one another in a 3D dimension. That's the Z uh, axis, that's why we say the Z index. If you ever use the program like Photoshop, this is sort of like the layers on, on Photoshop. We have one layer on top of uh, another and we get to see this composite result. Uh, we can use also uh, a, um, a negative number to affect uh, the default value. Uh, for example, I'm going to change the values that default to uh, their position, uh, the Z index position based on how they are uh, found in the document. And if I want this um, element, the paragraph, which is on top of the, all the other elements to go to the back, I can give with zero, as you can see, I have like the default position, but if I give it zero, um, a negative one, a negative one comes before zero, so title and subtitle are placed on top of this element. So I can also use the index zero to, uh, sorry, negative number to uh, place them like, uh, to place this element before the, the others, which has like, uh, which have like a Z index of zero. In which cases we must use Z index instead of position. Uh, it's not a case of whether we have to use one or the other. Uh, the Z index comes with a uh, position. Whenever we change the position from the default static to re relative or something else, we get the opportunity to work and change the Z index. So the Z index is just an extra that comes with the uh, elements that are positioned in a custom way instead of the ordinary static. Now, the, um, the cases where we change the Z index is when for some reason we don't like the default order that they appear. So uh, in, in here, uh, I don't know, maybe the, um, uh, the paragraph didn't have any content. It was just a red box and I didn't want the box to be on top of title and subtitle. I want it to be like on the bottom. I, use, I would use the index minus one to like uh, place it on the bottom. Um, now, I don't have, uh, to be honest, any very specific uh, example in my mind, um, but you will, uh, you will use the index only after you have changed the position. At some point you will uh, be playing around with position, relative, absolute, or some other value. And you might find yourself uh, having something, uh, having this stacking order, as we say, uh, in a manner that's not really like uh, working well for you. 
So maybe you want to move, uh, place some elements, um, ele or elements or element at the top or the bottom. So I will create a nav uh, for navigation. I will put an unordered list because I want to have a list of menu items. So I'm going to use three li elements, home, contact, let's say links. So I'm creating a basic navigation. I have a nav container element for uh, holding my navigation and unordered list because I want these list items to be ordered and to have a very basic structure and its link will be placed here. Now, of course, at this point, I must add an anchor tag because the links must be actually <laughs> linking somewhere. Um, but for the case of this, uh, for the sake of this uh, demonstration, I will just leave them like this. Uh, let's add some coloring so that we can I'm going to add a background color. Uh, I think I have a margin uh, margin top that I might want to remove. Or uh, where does this space comes from? Let's see. There is this white space on top where I have, ah, it's, it comes, as you can see, so yes, let's go here. I have this white space, which is not what I want. Uh, I want the, the navigation to stick like right here on the on the on the bottom. On the sorry, on the top. I don't want this extra space. But at this point, I really don't want don't know where this space comes from. At this point, without the inspector, I'm kind of lost. Let's say, uh, and I have to dig into the inspector, and by inspecting on different elements, I will find where the space comes from. So if you, if you can see, I'm highlighting the nav and everything is contained, the box model of nav is contained right there. So the extra space must be something else. If I hover the UL, you will see that the UL has this orange uh, spaces, top and bottom, which is actually the margin. So what is taking up this like space on top and on the bottom, but I'm mainly concerned with the top, is the margin, which is 16 pixels, on the UL element. So now that I've detected which element is producing this margin top, it's not the nav, as you saw, it's the UL. So we have this uh, nav, uh, we have like, now uh, reset, let's say with, no, let's, Okay, yeah. we have something like uh, this. Now, in order for these elements to become uh, in line, I have to change their display property. So right now, let's see what this you this li uh, they are. They have this like as you can see, user agent style sheet display list item. It's actually uh, pretty close to the block. It's like uh, they're like block elements, as you can see, they take up the whole line. It's like, like, it's like a hybrid here value, uh, but we're going to change this from display block, let's say for now, just think of block, to display inline block, because we want the menu To be placed, uh, to be displayed like this. So one way to uh, to make the contents uh, be like a normal navigation next to each other uh, is to put um, the display to inline block, um, and we could put some margin, let's say, on the left. To move them like this to have more space and now maybe we want some padding on the navigation to make it look uh, 
Okay, like this. Now we can just sort these things, uh, to sort this larger space on the bottom, but right now we're not going to be dealing with like the, the styling. We're just going to um, be looking at the position. Um, so let's make the, the page, first of all, a little bit higher. Uh, let's give a height to the body so that we can scroll up and down. I will go to the body, which now just takes this much space to display the nav and these three elements. So I'm going to give it a height of, let's say, 300, 3,000 pixels so that I can scroll like this. Okay. And I want the menu uh, to remain on top. Like I don't want when I scroll to, to lose the menu. I want it to remain like there on the top so that at all times I can see the menu. And for doing that, I'm going to fold some sections here. And I'm going to go to the nav and I'm going to change the position static, which is the default position, to position fixed. Now, what happens uh, when I set the position to fixed? Uh, I see that something strange, there's a, a strange behavior uh, of, the, of the element suddenly. And let's inspect just to get a first look at what happened. You can see that the width uh, stretched uh, to just the width that is um, taken from the, to display, is required to, to display the content. Um, it's moved over here. Now, in order to move uh, the position on a fixed, to move the element on a, on a fixed position, that's why we use the fixed, I have once again to use the top, bottom, right, or left. So in order to move right now, not push, but move the, uh, to fix the element um, on a certain uh, position, I will use the top with zero. And this top uh, will reflect the top side of the viewport. This means that when I have position fixed, I'm fixing the element uh, according or relative to the top uh, side to the top line, let's say, of the viewport. Where is the top of the viewport? It's right here. Uh, so, so I have like, here is like the top of the viewport, sorry. <laughs> okay. Uh, so I have like, here is the top of the viewport. And by of the viewport. Okay, uh, there's a bug by. Okay, and then I'm saying that this element will be fixed relative to the viewport, which is this area. Okay, and if I use the top, left, bottom, or right with a value, I'm placing the element. Um, fixing the element according, like say, to the top of the viewport. Or um, let's say according to the bottom, you can see it's moved to the bottom. And I can use like both top and right to uh, make the element stick fix uh, to the top of the viewport and to the right of the viewport. And from these uh, sides, I can also push the element. So from the right side, I can push it like 20 pixels to the left, or from the top, I can push it 20 pixels to the bottom, or I can use negative numbers. And then it will uh, move the other way. So by using the position fixed, we are fixing our element, we're positioning our element uh, according to the viewport. Uh, this means that I will put just a slight 
pixel here, I want to be like a menu. This means that as I scroll, the element will be always fixed to the viewport. So as you can see, it remains uh, right here. If I were to put this on the bottom, it will always stick at the bottom of the viewport. It doesn't matter how long uh, or wide uh, the page is, uh, the viewport is always the uh, reference of this element with position fixed. Uh, this is how we place our cookies. This is how we place our chat assistants, the chat you know, boxes that you see. This is how we place the navigation menus. Uh, the cookie notices, the COVID notices, or uh, advertisements. And right now, I'm going to like place this on the top, like really. Uh, let me clear this for now. And I'm going to give it a width of 100. And now I'm just taking up the whole uh, viewport space um, and fixing that little uh, glitch, let's say, that uh, was there when I changed from position static to position fixed. Uh, I have to give uh, a width. But at this point, when I scroll, the navigation remains like position there. But as you can see, these elements and I'm, let me see, I have, I think, Z index, yeah. They don't have a Z index, so I just, yeah. So they have like their, their normal stack, stacking order, which is according to how we see these elements on the page. So first we have the nav, that's why it is on the bottom. Then we have the title, title is on top of nav. Then we have subtitle, which is, on top of title and nav. And of course, at last we have the paragraph. So this doesn't look right, as you can tell, because at this point, my page content will be on top of the navigation. I won't be able to click. And this is where the index come into play. And right now, in order to make this stand out, I will go to the nav and set, as Vincent said, a Z index of, let's say, like a really high number. And right now, the navigation will always be like on top. And most of the times you will see like these really large numbers, uh, just to make sure that uh, if there's a Z index of 1000 or 100 or something else, we're pretty much using the maximum value. Um, so fixed, um, you've probably seen navigations. And as I mentioned earlier, You've probably seen how uh, the fixed is used for the cookies. So uh, our policy, blah, blah, uh, whatever you say will be used against you. Uh, and we have like this cookie notice. Uh, which let's say will give it a background color of bluish something, I don't know, and a large padding. And we want this to stick on the bottom. Most of the times you see like the, the cookies on the bottom. So position fixed, bottom, zero and with 100 and we get like the cookies right here because it's important for the users to see the, the policy and uh, of course they have to uh, click on this element and uh, either accept or uh, i don't know ignore the uh, or not accept the the rules and at that point, the um, developer must uh, remove this uh, element. And we do this most of the times with uh, display uh, none. So we kind of like set the, 
display to none, and then we remove it. But we have to get into JavaScript, uh, and we have to use JavaScript for this kind of interaction. Um, now, uh, let's move on to another position value, uh, the absolute value, which is a little bit tricky. Uh, so I will create, um, <clears throat> uh, I will use the navigation. Uh, so inside the navigation, I have a UL element with the contents, the contents here. And I'm going to place uh, another element. Uh, I will make it a span, which says, uh, I don't know, new version available. And um, it's going to show this element. I'm having some styling issues here, but uh, I won't bother with this issue. I will give it an ID of update and, and do a little bit of a styling here. Just a background color. Let's, let's give me, okay. Uh, let's say uh, yellow, green. Let's make it like this and give it just a slight padding. And I want to make this like really small. Now this, I don't want this to be too like uh, distracting our users, but I want them to see. Right now I have a navigation. It contains an unordered list and this uh, span uh, at the end. Let's check the uh, structure right now. So we have our navigation element. We have this unordered list, which as you can see has some margin, has some bottom margin. Um, um, I don't remember putting something other than resetting the margin top. And then we have like this uh, span, which sits like after the unordered list uh, on the left side. Uh, position light, uh, okay. Uh, body height margin. Okay, there's something right now uh, the new is like uh, falls a little bit to the left. Uh, padding. Uh, I'm not sure. Navigation width. Aha, uh -huh, let me see. Let me see if I can. Border box. Okay. So what was happening? Um, I had like this uh, navigation with a UL and this span tag. And let me like... Uh, uh, how can I know this will not make a difference? Um, uh, like padding, let me... Just um, trying to find some values that will make it okay. Yes, okay. So um, I'm just resetting the padding. So this is the navigation with the unordered list, as you can see, and then the span. And now if I add some padding on the navigation, uh, first of all, we must see that the, um, the, the width is 566. Now, this is the navigation with all the elements inside. If I add some padding, so we have like uh, 566. Um, and let's add the padding of 10, 
pixels. You will see that immediately I get some kind of padding, but there's the content is actually distorted. And, and the width, as you can see, has changed. And it has gone from 566 to 586. Uh, and this happens because by default, the padding and the border add to the width and the height of the element. So, for example, here, uh, I also have like this position minus 20. Uh, and uh, so we have like uh, 566, the width, along with 10 pixels uh, from the left and 10 pixels from the right of the padding. So these add up to make 586. If I was to add another 10 pixel, let's say border on the right and the left, you can temporarily do this by double clicking here and adding a border. Uh, I don't know, border left width. It should have taken the values. Uh, I'm not sure why, uh, let's 10 pixels. Okay, if even if we, I was to like add a uh, border left, let's I will add like border left 10 pixel and border right uh, 10 pixel solid. That would also add up to the um, elements width um, to the left and to the right, or to the bottom and to the um, top. I'm just using the width right now. So you will see that I have like 566, which was taken uh, from the relative uh, uh, width of the container um, and the, the viewport. Uh, then I had 10 pixels to the left and 10 pixels to the right uh, that would, would, were added to the total width of the element from the padding. And then I had border, uh, 10 pixels to the left and 10 pixels to the right. And these were added up to the initial uh, width. So instead of having 566, which was relative to the uh, viewport width, I now have like... Um, uh, 606, which is 566 plus 20 plus 20. And that's why I get this uh, position minus 40, because this uh, 10 pixel here, this 10 pixel here, this and this add up to 40. My width goes over the 100% of the viewport and the uh, nav navigation, the nav uh, element is. Uh, uh, just uh, moved a little bit to the left because there's not enough space to display the element. The viewport width is, uh, where is it? Uh, the viewport width is, I can, uh, yeah, let's tell me. Let's see. If The inner width is 500 and, uh, 576, uh, whereas this navigation has become like really too large to fit into the viewport uh, because the border and the padding add up to the contents, uh, to the elements uh, width and height by default. So if I want an element to be like 566 pixels or 500 pixels, or I don't know, have a specific width and height, I must take into consideration that the padding and the border add to this value. So if I say width 500, and then I add padding 10 pixels, I'm adding 10 pixels to the width, to the left and to the right, so a total 10 to pixels. The same goes for the height. So I can either uh, take into consideration the border and the padding that I'm using, because they will change the, the width and the height, the dimensions of the element. Or I can use what uh, uh, is a very, very useful CSS property, box sizing, uh, which actually um, tells 
how uh, I want the uh, box sizing, meaning the, the box model, uh, to work. And this border box value uh, contains the dimensions of the element to within the border box, meaning, just to make it simple, that when I set the width and the height of an element to be X and Y or A and B, this will always be the width and the height. The border and the padding won't add up to the total dimensions of the element. They will just fit inside the border box. CSS, the browser, will try to fit everything inside the box that has very specific dimensions. In this case, it's like uh, 100, which is relative to the viewport, which is like uh, 576. So by default, the border and the padding add to the dimensions of the elements, which is not what most of the times we want. Because uh, it get, can get tricky. It can get tricky when we want, let's say, to uh, put two elements together. We have like uh, 1,000 uh, pixels a container. We split the two elements to 500 pixels each. We give a width of 500 pixels and we see the two elements like together fitting uh, side by side. If at some point I decide to add some padding or some border to that element just to, to make them, to style them and to make them look better, I will be going over the 500 and I will be adding some padding and some uh, border pixels, which means that my uh, total of 1000 pixels will break. I will have like two boxes of, I don't know, 520 pixel seats and um, I won't have like the layout that I want. Uh, and in order to be strict about the dimensions of an HTML element, we can use this box sizing border box on the nav so that the position, let's see it, uh, the dimensions of the element are strictly what we uh, set here with width and height. If I add the padding, for example, if here the width is uh, 576 pixel, uh, I use the uh, JavaScript command to get the, um, the viewport width. So if it's 576, this will always be 576. If I add the padding, meaning I will also have a padding to the left and to the right, CSS will try to fit the padding inside this area. It will not add 20 pixels. It will just stay 576 and it will push the content a little bit to the center to make the padding as you see on the, uh, on the sides. And this box sizing and especially this value border box is uh, what we use on a daily basis. This was one of the best CSS features added to the language because you can understand how before this box sizing, we had like this headache of changing the dimensions and we had to figure out and calculate how the border or the padding um, changed the, the layout and the, the dimensions. But with this, uh, we are very strictly saying to the browser, stick to this width and height. Uh, so you will see this, uh, this setting uh, along with some other uh, general rules. So at some point you will see CSS libraries like Bootstrap that do this, that start the CSS with this one. The resetting for all elements, the margin and the padding, and they also add box sizing border box to all elements. Why? because it makes sense to say this box or the elements will be A, B, C, and the dimension remain the same. Otherwise, we are going to have a lot of trouble uh, figuring out uh, how the border and the padding affect um, uh, the dimensions. So box sizing border box is uh, one of the most helpful um, tools of CSS, one of the mostly, most uh, commonly used CSS um, properties. Now, I'm using it here on the nav uh, just to make everything look uh, well, as you can see. And I'm going back to my uh, position. So uh, remember how the position fixed uh, makes an element uh, 
be positioned according to the viewport. Uh, so we have the viewport like this whole area and with position fixed and top, bottom, left and right, that element, for example, here the cookies or the nav bar um, was placed, was positioned according to the coordinates, let's say, of the viewport or the, the viewport area. We can achieve pretty much the same thing, but instead of using the viewport as the container, as the relative, let's say, the, the point of reference, we can use any element we want as a point of reference for another element. For example, in here, we have this nav element and we have this update element, which is a child of nav. The span uh, here, the uh, ID uh, update is inside the nav. We can make the span be positioned uh, according to the nav uh, element. How can we do this? The first thing we have to do is to ensure that the parent element that will be used as a reference, just like the viewport was uh, used earlier for the position fixed, we must ensure that the parent element uh, will have a position other than static. So the nav here has position fixed, meaning it doesn't have the default static, and it can act as a reference for a child element. This is the first part. So for absolute positioning, we ensure that the parent element has a position other than static. It doesn't matter if we have fixed relative, uh, sticky or some other. The important thing is to have a different value uh, other than uh, static. Now, the nav is, uh, can be used as a point of reference, as, a, as a, uh, let's say as the coordinates uh, under which we can move the child element, which is the update. Right now, the element sits according to the normal flow of the document, meaning it's an inline element. It comes after a block element, the UL, and it just sits here and displays its content uh, right here on this box. But if I do position absolute, I can place this element uh, whenever, wherever I want, but um, according not to the viewport, as we saw with fixed, but according to the dimensions of the uh, parent element, which is the nav. As you can see, the position absolute, first of all, uh, removes, let's say, the element from the, uh, contain the container area, from the parent element. It's like right now, this element it's, it has come to the front. It's like on, on a different level, let's say, it's outside the, the nav. So it's it kind of uh, let's let's scroll. It kind of sticks outside uh, of the element. Uh, and in order to see how we can position the element according to the nav, is that we can use, for example, the right. And let's say the bottom. Remember how the sticky the sorry the sticky the position fixed moved the elements with position fixed to the top or to the bottom of the viewport. Position absolute moves the element according to the top, bottom, uh, left or right side of the parent element. Meaning the first element it finds when going upwards, like this is the child element, the first parent it finds is the navigation, the nav. If this element has a position other than static, it will become the point of reference for the span. And then the span will be placed, will be moved, will be positioned according to the, uh, to the nav element. And we can use write with negative or, um, or uh, positive values. We can use top once again with negative or uh, positive values. Now, uh, top, why is it, uh, maybe it's too, okay, yeah, it's too, it's too uh, less space. 
there's not much space, but so this enables me to uh, move the element according to the parent element, which is used as a point of reference only because it's the first element that it finds, that span finds by going upward, the uh, HTML hierarchy, that doesn't have a position uh, static. If the position static was not there on the nav, let me put here, the, let me put, uh, let's say, bottom, just to see the difference. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, so, if I put, um, let me see this, okay. Um, ah, okay, now, okay. So now, uh, mm, let me, let me give it a Z index. <laughs> because, okay, now, uh, you can see that the um, uh, the element is not positioned uh, absolutely uh, according to the nav because the nav has a position static. I've disabled this position fixed, so now nav has the default uh, position which is static. Then this element with position absolute tries to find a parent element to stick to tries to find a, a parent element that can use as its point of reference, as, it, as the coordinates, let's say, uh, according to which it can position itself. By going upwards, it finds the nav, but since the nav doesn't have like a position fixed or relative or something else, or even absolute, uh, it goes up the chain of the elements to find the body, which is the last. Uh, element that it can use as, an, uh, as a container. And now it uh, position itself according to the body, which is like, uh, this is a strange behavior of CSS. It's not like the whole page as I scroll down. It's actually the visible part of the, uh, of the page. This is a little bit weird, but this is one of the like uh, kind of weird uh, things of CSS. But the point here is to note is that right now this point, this uh, update is not absolutely positioned uh, according to the nav, but to the body. If I now enable the position fixed, it will be positioned, uh, absolutely positioned uh, right here. How and when do we use the position absolute? We use it all the time. Uh, to give you an example, let's say that um, we want to have something like a, um, uh, let, me, let me remember an example. Um, uh, for example, the cookie that we said before. Uh, you have noticed that whenever we see a cookie, we always, we always have a close button. Uh, sometimes we see like an X, like uh, an X uh, where we can close the, the cookie. This is a case where we want to use absolute, position absolute. So we are given this design and we are asked to uh, recreate this using HTML. So we create a box, we might give it like a border here of uh, cyan, put some image, some text, some buttons, but how do we position this element here? So this element might be an element inside this, like, uh, let's say, pop-up or box. The box will have a position other than static, like relative, which does not affect its uh, position at all, but it uh, overrides the static. So we should position, we should position, we should put a position relative on this element and then use position absolute on this element and then say write. For example, if this is 40 pixels by 40 pixels, we'll say um, write minus 20 pixels so that it, was, it will be absolutely positioned 20 pixels to the right of the parent element. And then we say top minus 20 pixels and it moves 
like a little bit to the top. Um, but I was actually looking for this kind of thing, uh, which is like uh, I've seen many times, uh, boxes or models that have like, you know, like uh, an X here or, you know, some kind of like this button and you can close it by, by clicking here. So how can we place an X uh, button, a close button on our uh, cookie? And the way that we can do this is that we can go to the cookie. We can place a span. Uh, we can put also a close to make it a little bit better. Uh, I will give it an ID of close. And I will have to find like the cookies here. So uh, close background for short background uh, sky blue uh, and maybe a little bit of a padding. But we don't really want this uh, element to be placed here, but to be placed here on the top, let's say. Uh, right of the cookie. How can we do this? Um, we have to set the position of this cookie to something other than static. Uh, right now it's not static, so it's fixed. Uh, if we didn't want uh, uh, to use fixed, which as you saw um, has a strange behavior with the width and it fixes the element on, let's say, on the according to the viewport, we could use position relative, which by default does uh, not move the element at all. So with position relative, we are, we can use an inner element as an absolute position element, and we don't uh, move the position from its initial static position at all. Uh, so in that cases, in these cases, we can use that position relative to achieve the uh, effect of absolutely positioning an inner element and then we will go to here we will say position absolute and then of course play around with the right and the top so we have the element we can say minus 10 pixels and 10 pixels from the right, like this. And we have a really nice clickable, let's make clickable, I mean, uh, have an area for, and we have a position in absolute element. Now, it doesn't matter where or how big this element is or uh, where the cookie is placed on the page, this little button will always accompany this parent element um, according to the top and right um, settings. And as I've um, told you before, it's a good opportunity to visit websites for, uh, for these things that we learn, visit websites and try to see uh, by, by just looking at the page if they're using some of these margins or these absolute positioning tricks uh, on their website. Uh, on this image, can you find an absolutely positioned element just on this image? Exactly. Uh, let's say it's probably one image, but if it wasn't, so status and position absolute. So in here, also this play button it's also a position uh, absolute element on this element. Um, this also on the video. Um, what else? So it's really nice to, to, to browse uh, various pages and try to see if you can spot like the, uh, the things that we, that we learn. Uh, let's say... Okay, let's see if it loads. Okay, it loads. Uh, kind of messy. 
let's go. Okay. And um, inside here, we're going to place a, uh, we want to place like something like a watermark. So for this, I'm going to create a, uh, a div and I will say image wrapper. And I will put the image inside along with the, uh, the watermark or the, let's say the information. So watermark, uh, I don't know, copyright, blah, blah, blah. Something like that. Uh, the first thing I have to do is give some borders to see where these elements sit on my page. So image wrapper border, like two pixels solid. Okay. And then I will give it a position other than static so that I can um, make my elements inside here uh, sit uh, on a specific position because I want the copyright to be placed on the top right. So I will put position relative, which does not change the position of the element, but it now has a different value than static, which is what I want when I want to absolutely uh, position an element like the copyright. So I'm going to go to watermark and say position absolute. It will not work. It will not be, uh, uh, the image rubber won't be used as the reference of watermark. It will be the next element upwards to the hierarchy that does not have a position static. So, okay, so let's background white. And I'm going to say uh, right and top. Uh, okay, so it's like here, uh, I need to go and change the image dimension to like, let's say 100% image, let's check this. So I'm putting the image, uh, giving it at the width of the image wrapper, or I can even change the image rubber's width just to make it, I don't know, something else. I have the copyright and I can also make it uh, behave like uh, vertically, like the one you saw on, on CNN, which is uh, now, uh, what was the direction? Text uh, direction, okay. Um, writing mode. Uh, okay, no. okay, yeah. I can say writing mode vertical uh, left to right, and I have like uh, exactly the same result, but with uh, CSS. Uh, and I can even place a, no, uh, a transparency. Right, and what was the, let me see, it's these two uh, CSS rules, let me, so text orientation, uh, let's, what's the values? Um, there's a combination of these two values, but I don't remember right now. Um, or I can use uh, transform to rotate. Uh, let me see if I can like, so I can do something like this, are you mean? Doing some advanced CSS, but we can rotate an element like, like this. And uh, so we have like our page. And we have the elements that are stacked like according to their 
uh, through the display, like the block elements, the inline elements, they are stacked from top to bottom and from left to right. Uh, this might be like display inline block. And then there's another like display block. These all these elements have a default value uh, of the position um, set to static. And they behave uh, according to the rules of like stacking block and inline elements together from a top to bottom and left to right approach. If we want to move an element from its initial static position, we use position relative. So if I want to move this element, but not the space it's occupying like this. So if I want to move it from the left to the right and from the bottom to the uh, top, I will use relative, position relative. So I can use position relative and then bottom, some pixels, left some pixel and push it to the right and to the top. So this is position relative, but this space is still occupied by the element. Okay, this space won't be given up to, to these elements, to the next element. It will be there waiting for the element, let's say, to come back. If I want an element to stick to the viewport, like put a chat assistant here. Hello, you know, how may I help you? They have like these chat boxes. Hello. So if I want to make something stick like this on the viewport all the time so that they can, let's say, chat, I can use position fixed. And when I want to position an element relative to another element, for example, if I want to position this element according to the bottom and the right of this element, I will use absolute. here and something uh, on this element, on the parent element, something not static. So that can be fixed, absolute, relative, sticky, and so forth. So this must have a non-static position. The, the first thing that we try is, of course, position relative, because as you show position relative without any other values for left, right bottom and top does not move the element so we put a position relative and then we can absolutely position this element according to this parent uh, there's also sticky uh, let me send you um, an example of the sticky uh, the sticky you, you will check this code uh, we have this element which has position sticky along with a, a value and we also have this position at the bottom. And with sticky, we have this. The element can be like moved or we can scroll. And when we can, we can say that when it hits like the top element, the body, it sticks there. But if I scroll down, it keeps, move, keeps moving. It sticks there. And this element sticks to the bottom. So I can scroll, as you can see, it can move. But when it hits the bottom, it sticks there, but they can also stick to another element, okay? Uh, so you have to dig more about uh, position sticky. We didn't have the time to look today. And of course, we saw like uh, the Z index, how with a position uh, relative, absolute, fixed, sticky, uh, all these elements are also uh, have a stacking order, they have the z-index, which enables us to move the elements, let's say, on the z-axis, on, on, the, on the back or on the front of, let's say, the screen, um, in a way that we're dealing with like a 3D dimensional space. Uh, so if you use any of these um, position values, you also have z-index value available to you. We have all sorts of ways to, to deal with the layout. Uh, this is just one way with a position. We also have float, we also have a CSS grid, we have a flexbox. There are really 
lots and lots of ways to, to position and our elements and um, work on the layout. Um, these are mostly used, for example, to make like uh, slight changes, slight movements or stick some elements like on the viewport uh, or even move an element in and out. For example, I might have a, uh, as I told you, a, a cookie notice like this, blah, blah, blah. And then with position and transition, I can animate this like out of the screen and then it will uh, be occupying any space. I can also uh, use JavaScript then to, to remove the element altogether, but with the position relative and the left uh, values, I can uh, put some um, positive values here. Then I can click and I put some negative values. Uh, and if I want this space uh, afterwards not to be occupied at all, I can uh, change once again through JavaScript, the display setting to none. So once it goes off the screen, I will just either put a display none or put a very, very uh, large negative Z index so that it is always uh, like on the bottom, let's say of the screen, and it does not uh, mess on conflict or conflict with other elements that might appear at this space. Um, so uh, that's it for today. Um, I hope you enjoyed. Let me know if you have any questions. Thank you.